Well, last night was a very special occasion at the Smithsonian Institute, and I'd just like to start off with that, Chris, if I may, because watching you and Margot Kidder, <laughs> watching 50 <laughs> years of history, that was kind of a kick. Mm -hmm. Must have been for you, too. It was fun. It was particularly fun to see that flying sequence from Superman 1, which I haven't looked at in a long time. And uh, we, we instantly remembered, we were standing there, and instantly remembered how difficult it was to shoot that. The you know the lower back pain, the, the heat, the, the 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 seven weeks that it took, and see at that time, Margot, I don't think really thought it was going to work, and I think she had an attitude of like, here I am, an actress with film credits from here to there, and I'm hanging out on some hydraulics <laughs> with this unknown actor from New York, and w I mean, I, what am I doing, you know? And I, I I used to have that sort of what am I doing feeling from Margot, and of course I was really gung ho, and I say like, well you know the temperatures you know, six degrees Celsius and the winds from the south at 10 knots and we're over the Brooklyn Bridge. You're and flying training. Oh, and I'm there. And so this used to this used to cause friction between us. So well, maybe that fed a bit of that natural skepticism that Lois has to have yeah. anyway. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, and I really like, if you, look, if you look at the history of Lois, Lois in the 50s wore these little pillbox hats and she seemed to embody this kind of suburban dream of, you know, of, of uh, the white picket fence and waiting for a husband and having the meat and potatoes ready in the oven and all this kind of <laughs> stuff. And then you cut to Margot in the 70s as, uh, as a girl who's, who's ambitious, has got a career, who's, you know, living on her own, doing just great, and, and wouldn't the idea of, like, cats and a mortgage and, you know, and, and staying home is anathema to her. So I think it's nice to watch. You could see, like, yeah. in, in, one, in one shot last night, you could, you could see how the characters have evolved over the And the word years. is out that your character's evolution, because of your portrayal, is affecting the DC Comics well, story. Well, yes, I guess that's right. I mean, they, have, they, they, they told me a while ago that they're now writing Superman based on the way I play him in the movie. So now, I that's got to be nice, <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. Meantime, behind the glass case, eventually we'll go an item of yours that you have kept. Oh, if they ask me, no one's asked me yet, but I've, I have kept one item from, the, from my 10-year history of Superman, and that is I cut out the S off the back of the first cape I ever wore and framed it into my son's bedroom, and if I ask him nicely, he'll part with it. <laughs> and what kid can boast that Superman's S is above... <laughs> his bed on his the bed wall, huh? I don't know. Isn't that <laughs> nice? <laughs> let's, let's assume now as we go into the 21st century that a new generation portraying the characters comes along and now the veteran, Chris Reeve, is going to give this new kid on the block some advice, mm -hmm. some warnings maybe, some uh, experience and hindsight. What might you tell this new stranger to the well, I would show? Well, I guess the, the first thing that I would say is don't don't lose the humanity of it. Remember that the basic ingredient of, of Superman is that he's a friend. And I mean, that's just simply, that's the value that's the most important to me, is, is not Superman as a muscle man, but Superman as a friend, a really good neighbor. I mean, somebody, I mean, the, the, this country was founded on the idea of neighbor, of, of, you know, walking five miles to lend your friend a, you know, a cow mm -hmm. or, or a, mm -hmm. you know, a planter or something. And I just, I just think that that's what, in this high-tech urban nightmare landscape that we've got, you know, of, of people feeling, feeling isolated and alone. They don't, they don't know their neighbors. They don't know who's next to them. They're afraid of other people in the street. You know, you know life is very overwhelming. The idea that, that early American value of a friend who's there when you need him is the key to the whole character. And a friend who has absolute power, but is not corrupted, absolutely. This is very unique yeah. to the Superman character, and I suppose an imperative for the actor, too, not to be corrupted by the power of playing Superman. Yeah, I've never felt that that was a factor. I've never felt, I've never felt some sense of power, you know, you know, really coming to me. I feel, though, that, that, uh, that, that, that within Superman, there is the qualities within Superman, forget that he can fly and the muscles and the, all that kind of stuff, but it's the qualities that he exhibits that, that people can identify with. You know, he's, really, he's really a gentleman. That's, that's the main thing. And um, I think to put that into big screen entertainment is, is perhaps an antidote to the Rambo style action pieces that are the alternative to watch in the summer. Tell us about your story credit. You said that there were three things that went into your idea of the conscience about nuclear arms. Samantha Smith's death, mm -hmm. the Gorbachev thing, and there's a third. The, I, I did, I did a, a documentary, um, narrated mm -hmm. a documentary and did wraparound interviews, uh, a program that some children had made called A Message to Our Parents, which is a film made by 12-year-olds about their fears of growing up in a nuclear age, and mm -hmm. this is what sparked the idea for the story. It's nice to see the character take on a global responsibility, even mm -hmm. though his father warned him in the first picture not to try and do that. Well, that's the whole dilemma. Every now and again, eventually, you've got to throw away the handbook. 
when you see that, that people need? You know, when do you, at what point do you play by the rules, and at what point do you answer the needs of the people around you? Mm -hmm. I think that's something that, that uh, you know, people can easily understand. Viewers are noticing the blonding hair here. Oh, this Long comes out of a bottle. Blade. Yeah, I'm doing a part right now where I hair, my hair had to be blonde. I'm doing a movie with Kathleen Turner that will come out for Christmas called Switching Channels. And uh, the guy I play, I don't know, I just decided he had to be blonde mm -hmm. for some reason. I'm getting, getting mixed reviews on it. Some people, <laughs> some people say something, keep it, and other people say forget it. You know, I just finished writing an article about so-called audience etiquette. Mm -hmm. I know you sounded off a bit on this before, and for the record, I'd love to hear you comment on this. Audiences, especially American audiences, don't seem to make the distinction at a play that they're not at home anymore. Yeah. They're in a theater. I'd like to hear some reactions on that. Is that true in your own experience? Well, I, you know, I, I work a lot in New York and, and in, uh, in Williamstown, and I find that the audience, uh, the audience has kind of forgotten how to listen, and, and particularly in the early part of a play, seem to be losing their ability to wait for the exposition, mm -hmm. you know, because we get, we're such sensa sensation seekers that if we don't like what's on this channel, we go click and see another channel. And we don't, we, we've lost the ability to wait for things to develop. And sometimes that'll cause people to talk or whisper or rustle programs or even come into the theater with shopping bags and stuff like that. It's, uh, and it, and it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's really our loss because uh, we need a theater of words and ideas and feelings and not, not just um, sensations blasted at us on, on the screen. I hope people don't, don't really lose the art of going to the theater. Look, if we do have another Superman film, maybe Superman can go to the play next time. That'd be an interesting con <laughs> confrontation. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering where you <laughs> cut to the chase in that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Chris Reeve. Sure. Superman 4. We're in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and I'm John Tibbetts for KCTV 5.